Okay, this is lecture nine. I'm gonna be talking about hemoglobinopathies, um, uh, specifically problems with the alpha, beta, gamma chain, and there's even a delta, delta beta chain that you'll be seeing. And I'll be talking about how, how, you, how these can be diagnosed and the different tests, um, like to determine sickle tests, uh, hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. I'm also gonna talk about the SED rate. I don't know if you guys did the SED rate test in the laboratory, but I'm gonna talk about what exactly is taking place when you actually do that test, all right? So hemoglobinopathies uh, are typically characterized by a structural defect in hemoglobin. Okay, as you know, the adult hemoglobin contains two alpha and two beta chains and fetal hemoglobin contains two alpha and two gamma chains. So remember, alpha, beta for adult, alpha, gamma for uh, fetal. So in hemoglobinopathies, the defects are in those two chains. If, if there are defects, then it's clinically significant. However, if there are defects in the gamma and delta chains, it's not really clinically significant. It's mainly the alpha and beta chains that we're concerned about. I think I mentioned this once before, the difference between a disease versus a trait. If you have the disease for a condition, certain condition, then that's called the homozygous. You have the full dose. In blood bank, again, um, the term is dosage effect. If you have the full dose, that means you have both genes that causes the disease, that's homozygous. And that's the disease state. You you know both barrels are loaded. On the other hand, you have the trait state. It's a less serious condition. Um, the symptoms are less severe. Um, homozygous are very severe. In the trait, you only have half the dose. You have the full dose of of, of the gene, and then um, half a dose of uh, the other gene. And it's that's called a heterozygous condition. Okay. So it's a full dose plus half, so it's heterozygous. The symptoms are usually less severe, and it also could be uh, asymptomatic. Okay, so you're going to have to know amino acid sub substitutions for some different hemoglobinopathies, and there are only three. But whenever you have a, an amino acid substitution, that's called a qualitative structural defect. And what that means is there's a substitution of one amino acid or another amino acid um, at a certain position on, on, on the globin chain. For a quantitative, that was qualitative, for a quantitative structural defect, that means you have impaired production of the globin chain, impaired production, and it's not an amino acid substitution. So quantitative is impaired production, substitution is qualitative, okay? And the types of heme structural defects I'm going to talk about are SC, SC, and hemoglobin E. So the first one is hemoglobin S, and that's also known as sickle cell disease. All of these are sickle, by the way, um, whether it's S, C, or SC. Um, and, the and the amino acid substitution, it's valine for glutamic acid on the sixth position of the beta chain. You will be asked this guaranteed, okay? Hemoglobin S is valine for glutamic acid on the sixth position of the beta chain. And this is the one that's seen in Blacks, uh, sickle cell disease, seen with Blacks or people with Black ancestry. Hemoglobin C, the amino acid substitution is lysine for glutamic acid on the sixth position of the beta chain. So it's, it's a little similar Valine for glutamic acid on the sixth position. This one is lysine for glutamic acid on the sixth position of the beta chain. And this hemoglobin C is also found mostly in blacks. Hemoglobin SC is due to two abnormal beta chains, hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. These are abnormal beta chains, okay? Also found mostly in blacks. There's no amino acid substitution, but the sim symptoms are sim are like sickle cell, similar to sickle cell. No amino acid substitution, two abnormal beta chains. Hemoglobin E is an amino acid substitution. And this one is lysine 
for glutamic acid, but this time it's at the 26th position of the beta chain, the 26th position of the beta chain. This one, hemoglobin E, is not found in Blacks. It's mostly found in Southeast Asians, like Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, okay? So knowing that, I can give you a case study where a 32-year-old male from Cambodia, for example, or, or the Philippines, for example, was exhibiting uh, anemia, and they didn't hemoglobin electrophoresis, what would be the likely hemoglobinopathy of this patient suffering from? If it was a, hemo a hemoglobinopathy was identified, which one would be the more, most likely one? And you would say uh, this person is suffering from hemoglobin E. Disease shows mild anemia. It's not, that's not too severe. And that's for the disease. And, but for the trait, it can be asymptomatic. So it's not that really severe. That's hemoglobin E uh, substitution, amino acid substitution. And now there's the thalassemias. You got alpha thalassemia, and then you got beta thalassemia. If you guys are following uh, on your notes, there's going to be a correction coming up. Okay. Are you guys following on, the, on your own PowerPoint? Okay. So make sure there's going to be some corrections, and it'll be easier to understand. <clears throat> In alpha thalassemia, the problem is alpha change. It's either reduced or absent. So you have an increase in beta and gamma chains. So alpha thalassemia, you have an increase in beta and gamma. Make sure you know that. Beta and gamma chains are increased. The problem is with the alpha chains, and it's reduced or absent. Alpha thalassemia is a disease manifested immediately at birth or in, or in utero. And early presentation reflects the switch from the embryonic hemoglobin to fetal hemoglobin, which, in, which uh, affects the gamma, okay? Fetal hemoglobin, now, now knowing that hem fetal hemoglobin is alpha and gamma, it's the gamma that's being affected. And the switch from embryonic to fetal takes place six to eight weeks gestation. And alpha thalassemia has a wide range of clinical expression. So we have... In alpha thalassemia, you have a decrease in alpha, but you have an increase in gamma chains, okay, and beta chains, increase in gamma and beta chains. And that's where the problem is on alpha thalassemia. It's the increase in those two chains. Or an excess in gamma chain will result in, <laughs> will result in gamma 4, tetramer gamma 4. An increase in beta chain will result in beta-4, okay, the tetramer beta-4. So gamma-4 is also known as hemoglobin Barks disease, and beta-4 is also known as hemoglobin H disease. These are tetramers, like I mentioned, and you can we can identify this by doing hemoglobin and electrophoresis, and I'll discuss that later on in this lecture. And what happens is these tetramers will during infection will create hemolysis, okay? These tetramers will cause hemolysis during infection. So beta-4 and gamma-4 are the problematic chains here. For hemoglobin BARTS, hemoglobin BARTS is the more significant. That's the gamma-4. So it's a complete deletion, homozygous for complete deletion of both alpha globulins, okay? Because it's now gamma. Gamma four. And affected infants are either stillborn or will die within a few days after birth. This is gamma four. And at birth, the infants are severely anemic, edematous, demonstrate ascites, mark hepatomegaly, and splenomegaly. These are conditions where survival rate is very, very low. Okay, so hemoglobin Bart is gamma four. Okay, it's gamma four. In hemoglobin BART uh, causes hydrops fatalis in the infant. For mothers, the pregnancy is complicated by preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure or protein in the urine. Uh, there's labor complications and postpartum hemorrhage. It's in the mother. Preventions, if you know that the, the mother has hemoglobin BART, you can do antenatal prenatal diagnosis. And usually 
um, they'll do a prenatal screen, I think. Yeah, they'll do a prenatal screen at so many weeks. And this is one of the markers. Ultrasound screening in the first trimester can also detect Bart's hemoglobin uh, hydrops fatalis. <clears throat> hemoglobin H, on the other hand, this is beta 4. Hemoglobin H is beta 4. And uh, the survival is a little better because the age can range from zero to 74 years old. So you can have beta four up to, you know, being 74 years of age. And it has a wide range of clinical severity ranging from mild anemia to requiring regular transfusion. I mean, it's a transfusion dependent uh, thalassemia that's called TDT. Transfusion dependent thalassemia is called TDT. Most cases are discovered in adulthood. So you can have a normal life and still have hemoglobin H disease. Um, you can be anemic, pallor, weakness, uh, and you can have a hypochromic microcytic anemia like iron deficiency, like you can mistakenly be iron deficient or have thalassemia. So you can have this, you can be anemic, but you can have it uh, up to um, 74 years of age. Okay, this is beta four. All right, that's that's alpha thalassemia. Now beta thalassemia. Beta thalassemia is the defect in the beta chains, but and the beta chains are either decreased or absent, and that's where the problem is in beta thalassemia. The beta chains are either decreased or absent. The alpha chains, on the other hand on beta thalassemia are, will be increased, or norm, or I'm sorry, or relatively increased or normal, okay? So you can have excess alpha and that'll produce precipitates. And these precipitates can lead to hemolysis. So you can have problems on the beta chains and you can have problems on the alpha chains. Alpha, alpha excess alpha causing, causing hemolysis and decreased beta uh, chains or absent beta chains, okay? But for beta thalassemia, the beta chains are either decreased or absent. And that's where the problem is. Okay, so the most severe clinic, beta thalassemia major, you got major and minor or intermediate. I'll talk about the other one later. So beta thalassemia major, it's the most severe clinical expression of beta thalassemia. So it incurs in patients with homozygous beta identical mutation. So here's where you're gonna make a correction. Instead of beta four, it's beta zero, okay? Make that beta zero, it's a tetramer. So cross out the beta four and make it beta zero. So, so the, the designation of the beta in beta, beta thalassemia is either gonna be beta zero or beta plus, superscript plus or superscript plus plus. In the beta zero, there's no beta chain. Okay, there's no beta chain. That's why this is the most severe. And infants present within the first year of life, failure to thrive, pallor, recurrent infection, abdominal enlargement, or splenomegaly. Okay. Then the other one is called beta thalassemia minor or intermediate, beta thalassemia intermediate. And it's, all, it's also called beta thalassemia trait. So the first one is the disease, obviously, because it's homozygous. Whenever you have homozygous, remember it's the disease. And this is the trait because it's heterozygous. Okay, so you have mild hypochromic microcytic anemia. And here you make the correction, uh, to strike out the beta four and it's, or beta zero and it's beta plus. So the heterozygous is either gonna be, that means there's, there's a little bit of beta chain there, but not that much. It's either gonna be beta plus or beta plus plus. That's the, that's the least severe. Okay, reserve the beta zero to um, the homozygous form. Patients with uh, um, thalassemia minor or intermediate, the, they're asymptom asymptomatic unless um, you're undergoing periods of stress, like pregnancy infection or folic acid deficiency. And here for the trait on beta thalassemia minor, the diagnosis is incidental, meaning that you're not feeling well, so you're going to go to the doctor, and the doctor say, "Oh, yeah, you're not, you're not iron deficient. You're, you have uh, beta thalassemia minor." Okay, it's incidental. 
Okay. So that's it for the thalassemia. Uh, the next one is what's called hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F. And at, um, in a previous lecture, I talked about how the, the fetal hemoglobin, after you're born, after a couple months or so, after a couple weeks, the hemoglobin F transitions over to hemoglobin A2 and then ultimately hemoglobin A. Well, in hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F, you have a complete absence of hemoglobin A and A2, um, and you have 100% hemoglobin F. That's hereditary persistence of hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin, okay? And it doesn't produce any significant hemato hematological abnormalities. You can lead a normal life. It's just that your hemoglobin is hemoglobin F. So laboratory findings, you got, you're not anemic, no significant, significant red cell changes, occasional target cells. Uh, laboratory findings uh, for the homozygotes. From what, um, actually, you know, those, those minimal symptoms are for the heterozygotes. For the homozygotes, the more severe one, you got um, microcytosis, aniso, poik, and many target cells. That's in the, in the homozygotes. Remember, the homozygote is more severe than the heterozygotes in terms of symptoms, okay? The next one is hemoglobin Lepore syndrome. Hemoglobin Lepore syndrome is um, called delta beta thalassemia. And it's a defect in the delta chain and the beta chain globin synthesis. The homozygote means that there's no hemoglobin A or A2. And the heterozygote is, has normal A2 and a high hemoglobin F. Okay. But the key thing on, on the pore, it's a fusion or de, um, of the delta and beta chain and the globin synthesis. And this type of syndrome, this uh, type of hemoglobin was named after a family in which it was first found. And the abnormal hemoglobin was found to show a fusion between those two globin chains, the delta chain and the beta chain, it's hemoglobin Lepore. The gamma chain will combine with the alpha chain to form normal functional hemoglobin F. That's not a problem. The heterozygote shows mild anemia and the homozygote, again, will cause severe transfusion dependency. Hemoglobinopathies, okay, now we're talking about hemoglobin electrophoresis. So you can have various proteins diluted with buffer in an electric field between two electrodes. Have you guys gone over electrophoresis in chemistry yet? Yes, no? Does that term sound familiar to anybody, electrophoresis? Yes. You guys have done it? or been discussing it. So that's where you have a protein. You inoculate a gel plate. You inoculate a gel plate and you subject it to an electric current, which, and the current flows in a circuit. And the direction of the circuit will drag along or separate or fractionate the protein into the, based on the charge of the protein molecules, the size and the pH condition and the type of hemoglobin. So depending on the hemoglobin charge, charge, size, and pH conditions, then you can get pretty good separation of the various hemoglobins. In basic conditions, the cellulose acetate cannot separate A2, C, or E. It cannot separate S from D, and it cannot separate F from G. However, in acid pH or citrate agar, so in the alkaline cellulose acetate, versus citrate agar, you have pH of 6.0. You can separate C from A2 and E, separate S from D, separate F from G, but you cannot separate uh, hemoglobin G, D, E, or A, okay? I may or may not ask these questions. They're, they're kind of like CL, CLS level. And then finally, sickle cell testing. There's three sickle cell tests that I'm gonna be talking to you about. And the sickle cell testing is based on the ability of uh, cells, red cells to sickle in a reduced state or form turbid suspension due to its solubility, decreased solubility. So the first test is sodium metabisulfite. Sodium metabisulfite. So what happens is whole blood 
is mixed with sodium metal bisulfite, and it's a strong reducing agent. And what happens is when you add the whole blood to the sodium metal bisulfite, you're actually forming the for, forcing the red cells to be shaped in sickles. When that happens, then it's a positive test with the sodium metal bisulfite test. So in sickle cell disease, sickle cell disease, the sickling reaction will occur more rapidly than in sickle cell trait. So remember, disease is more severe. It take the reaction takes place faster. For the trait, it's less severe and it'll take place slower. Hemoglobin SC and SC disease will sickle more rapidly than hemoglobin AS. Okay, so, but the, the, the key thing to note is that sodium metal bisulfite, when you add it to whole blood, will create sickle cells. You're artificially forcing the cells to create sickle. Okay, that's a sodium metal bisulfite test. The next one is a dithionite tube test. And this is based on um, you're, you're lysing the red cells with a chemical called saponin, and then you're going to reduce it with thionite, okay? the, hence the thionite tube test. And so what happens is when you add thionite to hemoglobin S cells, what you're looking for is the formation of tactoid crystals, giving a turbid appearance. So if you, get, if you add thionite to the lysed red blood cells, um, you know, remember, once you lyse the red blood cells, you're freeing up the hemoglobin. You have free hemoglobin now. Once you add thionite and you look for tactoid crystals, if it's turbid, meaning the presence of tactoid crystals, then that's a positive test. That's a positive test. Other positive results will be seen in hemoglobin Bart's and hemoglobin C Harlem. Um, you can clear the turbidity um, by uh, adding urea in that uh, cases break in uh, the hydrophobic bonds, hydrophobic bands of hemoglobin, hydrophobic bonds really uh, in hemoglobin S thereby clearing the solution. So you can re reverse the tur turbidity reaction. But remember it's adding thionite to uh, the lysed red blood cells, and then you're um, looking for turbidity, the tactoid crystals. And that's the dithionite tube test. And then the third one is the alkali denaturation re test. The alkali denaturation test. And um, it uses the characteristic of fetal hemoglobin to resist denaturate, denaturation um, in an alkaline solution. So you take a hemoglobin, Homolysate is added to Drabkin's reagent and then to the alkaline reagent, sodium hydroxide, for a specific time. What will happen is normal hemoglobin will be denatured or destroyed, but hemoglobin F, so here you're testing for hemoglobin F, will not be destroyed. So you, you check for the presence of hemoglobin F by um, running it through a spectrophotometer. Okay, so you run normal hemoglobin and then you'll, you'll run your test. If um, the presence of hemoglo uh, hem hemoglobin F is present, it won't. It'll be turbid and will not be destroyed. Okay. So that's the alkali denaturation test. And then the last test is the formation of Heinz bodies. We all remember Heinz bodies, G6PD and bite tests. So what happens is um, you can actually create Heinz bodies. What you do is you expose your red blood cells to acetylphenylhydrazine to cause the formation of Heinz bodies. If you add the acetylphenylhydrazine to the red blood cells, you can create Heinz bodies. And it can be detected, as you know, not through white stain, but with crystal violet. Okay? If, you if you stain it with crystal violet and you look at your smear, and you look for Heinz bodies, and that's a positive test. So acetylphenylhydrazine is the reagent to test for the presence of Heinz bodies. So hemoglobin erect electrophoresis, and it's based, the principle is electrophoresis or separation is based on the movement of charged particles in an electric field. Normal and abnormal hemoglobins will show different migration patterns based on the size, weight, and the type of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin types have different electrical charges and move at different speeds, like I just said. And the amount of each hemoglobin type in the current is also measured. 
I'm not sure. I don't think I'll give you um, an electrophoretic pattern like this. I just remember it when when I took my test for CLS. But there's the the patterns are different. Um, alkaline versus acid, the cellulose acid, uh, cellulose acetate um, media at pH 8.4 versus a citrate auger at pH 6.0 to 6.5. Uh, I don't think I'll ask you this on a quiz or a midterm. So here is the separation. This is one where if you look at the control, control, remember, for electrophoresis has all the possible hemoglobins present. So and if these are your possible unknowns, what you do is you look at the migration or where the bands show up and match it with your control. And that will help you de help you determine the type of hemoglobinopathy. Like that's normal. That's um, that's a normal pattern. It doesn't hit, it's A, no F, SDG, or A2, or it does have A2, but no F or SDG. And the sickle cell trait has the SD and G, hemoglobin D, it's the same pattern, and SC. So the, these are the different hem, um, separation, uh, separation patterns for the different types of hemoglobins. Okay. That's it for the hemoglobinopathy portion. And now it's a, uh, the ESR, sedimentation rate. It's one of the easiest tests to do in the laboratory. You, you drop whole blood into um, I think it's calcium chloride, and then you set it on a stand and you, you let the cells um, sediment by itself. And then you read it after an hour. You look at the interface between plasma and the red cells and that determines your sedimentation rate. So it's the rate, you're, what you're doing is you're looking at the rate of the cells falling during a given interval of time. It's the sedimentation rate. It's the time it takes for the cells to sediment, okay? Usually, and it's an, it's an old test, but they still use it. People still use the sed rate. So the ESR is a nonspecific measure of inflammation. It's a nonspecific measure of inflammation. Make sure you know that. Make sure you know that. I think that's either gonna be on your board exam or definitely from me, okay? So the mechanics of this test, the ESR is governed by a balance between two things, fibrinogen and a negative charge on the red blood cells. And a negative charge on the red blood cells is called the zeta potential, okay? And these are the factors that'll help determine the sedimentation rate, the presence of fibrinogen and the negative charge on the red cells. So what happens, say for example, inflammation takes place in the, in the individual. When there's inflammation, uh, a large proportion of the fibrinogen will cause the RBCs to stick together, okay? Fibrinogen will cause RBCs to stick together and that's where you get Rouleau formation, okay? So, so um, that's during time of inflammation. So when you have RBCs that stick together, then and that actually accelerates the, the rate of sedimentation in, in the column of uh, in the column of the your ESR column. And this test was invented by this Polish doctor named Edward Edmund Bernacki, 1918, a long time ago. Swedish pathologist and uh, Swedish pathologist Robert Sano Various. So the stages of the sedimentation rate test, the ESR, the first 10 minutes is called the stage of Rouleau. The next 40 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, is the stage of sedimentation. And the final 10 minutes is the sedimentation slows as the cell packs to the bottom of the tube. Okay, those are the three stages. First 10, 40, and then the final 10. Normal values for men are 10, 10 to 12. Uh, the age group 17 to 50, men 10, women 12, um, 51 to 60, men 12, women 19, and greater than 61, men 14, and women 20. So that's, those are the normal values. I don't think I'm going to ask you these normal values on a quiz. If I am, I'm going to tell you. Okay, if I am, I'm going to tell you. But it's not red, so at this point, I don't think normal values for said rates will be on any quiz. But this you'll have to know. The ESR is increased um, 
in inflammation, obviously, pregnancy, anemia, and rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis. The SED rate is increased in those four, inflammation, pregnancy, anemia, and rheumatoid arthritis. And it's decreased in polycythemia, sickle cell anemia, hereditary spherocytosis, and congestive heart failures. So make sure you know when the ESR is increased and when it's decreased, all right? And that's it for hemoglobinopathies and ESR. Any questions? Make sure you understand um, the hemoglobinopathies, hemoglobin um, parts, hemoglobin H, et cetera, all of those. So, I have a curious question. A curious question? Yes. Okay. All right. So why are some of the anemia deficiencies prevalent in certain parts of the country? Like for Blacks, why is it's it so genetic. prevalent? It's genetic. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, why isn't a lot of Filipinos, why don't, why don't, well, you know, why don't we have, um, well, I can say, you know, and Filipinos can have thalassemia and we can be iron deficient. Remember, iron deficiency can be acquired if you have, um, but, you know, Scandinavian, the parasites, mm -hmm. parasites, you know, I mean, that's, that's uh, in the, in, in that area of the world. Um, because they eat a lot of the fish and that's where the, the parasite is located, the, the diphthalobothrium latum, but it's, it's genetic and geographic lo located. But usually you, you'll think if a person has sickle cell, well, it's probably a, uh, a black individual. But then as you, as I mentioned, you know, if you're from Southeast Asia, you can have uh, a mild form of the sickle disease. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's see here. Okay, for the quiz tomorrow. I'm going to turn off my video. Or maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should not share my screen because if I flash the quiz, that means I'm sharing my screen. Stop sharing. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay, but you can't see my screen, right? No. No. No? Are you sure you're telling me the truth? I'm gonna flash, yes. the, flash the quiz on the screen. Oh no, I don't see it. <laughs> All right. You know, so you know the difference between the hams and the sucrose hemolysis test, right? And you know that um, typically in anemia, what's decreased and what's increased? Anybody? In which need? Not, and I'm not talking a plastic. I'm just talking a normal, regular type anemia. So anemia means what cell line are you looking at? Red blood cell. The red blood cell. Okay, yeah. so your RBC markers are what? Increase or decrease? Decrease. decrease. Okay, and what's increased? RDW. And what else? Right, the reticulum. And you know the conditions for for anemia, and that's in your homework, the, the two conditions for anemia. Anybody want to mention it real quick? Increase destruction, decrease production. Perfect. Okay. And I mentioned this a million times, the type of anemia of iron deficiency in anemia hypomicro hypomicro um i 
I mentioned this today. Incre increase or excess gamma and beta is what type of thalassemia? Alpha. Okay. If you have RBC destruction, what type of anemia is that? Hemolytic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hemolytic. I nodded, but you can't see me nodding. Okay. Um, or maybe it could. You know, the P PNH, the cold agglutinins, and the PNH. What type of anemias are those? Anemia. Say that one more time. Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Right, autoimmune. These are antibodies against yourself. You're not introducing anything to your body. You just have it in your body, and all of a sudden you're peeing uh, orange and, and amber. Okay. And then what's the most common way to get an alloimmune antibody? Transfusion. Blood transfusion. Correct. Correct. I nodded. <laughs> I nodded, but I don't know if you can see me nodding. And what is nope. the what is the condition for when you have hemolytic disease with a newborn? What is the condition of the baby? What is that disease called? Fanconi's anemia. Say again. Is it Fanconi's? No, not Fanconi's. That's a plastic. Remember, Fanconi's oh. is the six fingers and uh, the short stature. That's, um, this is HDN where the mother attacks, mother's antibodies attacks the baby. So what is the condition of the baby called? Mm. Hello, I mean. hmm? No, what is it? Yeah, that's the one. It's a bad, it's bad news for the baby. All right. Uh, remember C, PCH, preexisting cold is in children. What's the name of the antibody? You remember? If you see it, will you know it? Yeah, probably. Anti-I? Okay, yeah. No, it's wrong. anti D. <laughs> I threw it out there. I'm telling you, I'm going to trick you guys. <laughs> How about anti D? No. No. Okay. No, that's not familiar. It's the one. It's the one with the two people's names. Ooh. Don is land something. Inside. That's the one. If you get the Don F part, you can you you know you know what the answer is. Okay. And you know the shapes of the different cells, right? For example, RBC is a, what's the shape of RBC? Like concave. Right, and what's the shape of a target cell? Bell. And what's the shape of a um, stomatocyte? Bowl. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I hope you're sure. I hope so. <laughs> All right. And you, like I said, you know, confirmation versus screen. Um, is, is hemolysis due to um, burns? Is that mechanical? No. Burns, really? No. You sure? It's osmotic. Okay. This one, I'm just checking. I just want to make sure. All right. What's the benefit? One of the benefits, the bennies, of having G6PD deficiency? No malaria. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of cool, huh? No malaria, especially since there's no malaria here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Other problems to worry about. And then you know how, you know what happens when 
when you have when you get sick and you have a G6PD deficiency, right? <clears throat> What causes what causes your symptoms? What triggers it? Drugs. Drugs, yeah. What kind of drugs? Um antibiotics? Antibiotics, right? Benzene? Insecticides. Insecticides. Also. Insecticides. Hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll let you guys look that one up. But there's one I wanted to ask you. Oh, okay. I see. Here's one. Okay. So, um, a plastic, a plastic anemia. Okay. So, a plastic anemia can be reversed. Can be reversed uh, by reducing the ionizing radiation as low as 300 to 500, is that correct? Under what value? Uh, it, I, um, hemolytic anemia, you have hemolytic anemia due, due to ionizing radiation. It can be reversed if you lower it to doses of 300 to 500 rads. Wrong. Oh, no. Who said wrong? True. I said wrong. Wrong. I said wrong. wrong. Why is wrong. that? Why is that? Below 300 is reversible. 300 to 500 is the uh, irreversible type. That's correct. Okay, so it sounds like the low, I, I made it sound like the low threshold was 300 to 500, but that is the irreversible range. So if I said, Oh yeah, if it's low, if it's as low as 300 to 500, then you're good to go. But it's actually um, less than 300 and the 200. Okay, you picked up on that. So remember, on these true and false questions, make sure you read it thoroughly. Okay, make sure you read the true false questions thoroughly. I like to twist the words around. And I also like to say it's still baseball season. So I'll throw curve balls at you. All right. All right, are there any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, no? No. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions, then good luck on your quizzes tomorrow and I will see you next week. No exam next week, but you'll have quizzes on eight and nine. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Have a good week and good luck on your quizzes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Right. Good night. You're welcome. Thanks.